So what we've done so far is we talked about um, the, the receptors and then how the, the cochlea causes the, the receptors to, to be tuned to different frequencies. And what does that mean? That means that it, it kind of takes a little chunk of, of time of the sound pressure wave and it turns it into it does like a Fourier transform, approximately a Fourier transform of that, which means to separate it into its different frequencies for that little chunk of time. Um, but then that information uh, goes into the uh, goes into the central nervous system, into the into the cochlear nuclei, and as we look at the responses there, we'll see we'll see that they're actually. Um, they're actually not the same as the Fourier transform. It's more complicated because the, uh, the responses are actually locked to a particular cycle of the, of the sound pressure wave, the actual spikes. And so that's what we're going to sort of talk about, how that, uh, how, how that information that's coming out of the cochlea basically goes into the cochlear nucle nuclei and, and gets turned into it gets turned into these streams and it, in, a, in a very similar way to what we've seen in the, in the visual system and the somatosensory system where you take like one stream of information and you differentiate it, you divide it into two different or more than, more than two different streams that emphasize different aspects of the information coming in. So that's a, such, a, such a, a sort of a neural motif that occurs across all these different sensory modalities. So what the, what the data I'm going to talk about today, if you, you can look it up in the readings if, if you want, but it basically comes from owls. And so, so here's an owl, and they've got nice big eyes, and here's the business end of the owl. And uh, so, so why owls? Um, well, um, if we just take a tiny tour through evolutionary biology, it's like, where did owls come from? Uh, basically... You know, back in you know back in the day when there were dinosaurs around, mammals were just tended to be kind of small, scr scrunching around in the in the leaf litter, and and the dinosaurs kind of took up all the all the space. And when di when the dinosaurs went extinct, the mammals uh, radiated into all these different niches that ha had been freed up because uh, because of the dinosaurs not being there in the day. But the one um, branch of dinosaurs that survived was birds. And so birds are basically dinosaurs, surviving dinosaurs. And so they were up, you know, like um, uh, in, in the daytime and sort of occupying the daytime real estate. And so that's why, that's why bats, which are the most common mammal, actually, uh, that's the, there's more bats than any other kind of mammal. mammal. That's why bats are, are actually up at night because the daytime real estate was taken up by the birds. But some of the birds went... In, took up, did a little bit of night action as well, and an owl is an example. And so this is, this is a barn owl, and the barn owl has these, its ears are kind of, uh, they're kind of sort of in the front, and there's like a little, there's kind of like a little radar dish of, of hard feathers underneath, uh, underneath the ear, and, and they're sort of pointed, they're basically pointed forward. And what owls can do like a barn owl can do. Uh, it evolved in the barns that sort of, you know, in the early, early um, uh, Cenozoic were barns, of course. <laughs> and, but uh, what the barn, uh, the barn owl can do is it can actually, if you have like a little rodent uh, scrunching around in the litter down here, in a complete pitch black situation, you can film this in infrared. An owl can can localize that little scritching noise and in complete darkness go down and, and nail it. Just using passive, it's not echolocation, it's just passive, uh, in, incredible passive auditory processing. And there's a lot of parts that we don't exactly understand, like how, how do they not, you know, hurt themselves by running into the floor? So they can, they can not only do sort of like the, the XY position of the rodent, but they can also sort of figure out how far away it is, strictly from passive cues. And so they have like a s really souped up um, auditory system. And so, you know, you say, is, is that, you know, characteristic of, you know, all other animals? 
you know, why should we study this one? Because this one is, is so souped up. And the reason that neurobiologists like to look at um, animals like an owl is that everything is it's just souped up. <laughs> it's just bigger. So you just look at all these nuclei. Uh, they're there. They're present. The exact same nuclei are present in a turtle. Uh, but a turtle's hearing, is pretty, the low frequency is okay, but it's not anything like the sort of high-performance uh, unit of an owl. And so one of the reasons to study these, these like highly evolved animals is that the, the nuclei are bigger. Uh, it's, it's kind of easier to figure out in a way because the because everything's so souped up. Uh, so, so that's, that's and you, you might say, well, you know, people can't do this. You know, you, you can't in complete darkness do this. It turns out you can actually do a reasonable job of it, you know, uh, not, uh, not anywhere near as good as an owl, but you can definitely localize things in, 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 in both X and Y. And so this is, this is relevant. And it also gives us a chance to kind of look at how, how the, the auditory system sort of plays around with, with maps of different kinds. And it just gives you some idea for what the, you know, what evolution and the nervous system are capable of doing and, and what do they typically do? That's really, really the interest here. So, so let's start off with these owl, owl nuclei. So we'll start off with, with what, uh, you know, we call the time pathway. And the time pathway the time pathway is basically the Y-like pathway. So this is, you know, this is, you know, the Y-like one that responds to transients. And we know from the visual system, somatic sensory system, that the, the more transient ones, you know, are large. The cells are large, magno. Um, and this, this nucleus is called uh, nucleus magnocellularis, that's magno for big, so this is, this is in an owl, nucleus magnocellularis, so, so it's the large cell nucleus, uh, and th this one, this one is like the, there were three cochlear nuclei that the, that the cochlear ganglion projects into. There was the, the anterior ventral cochlear nucleus, which is what this one is like in mammals, anterior ventral cochlear nucleus. And then there was the posterior ventral cochlear nucleus, and then there was the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So birds d don't have a dorsal cochlear nucleus. So this one is equivalent to the, and if you look in a mammal, the anterior ventral cochlear nucleus has got big cells in it. Uh, looks very similar to this. So, so, um, w so what do the responses look like? So I'm going to draw a sort of um, uh, a sound in the response and another sound in the response here. So, so here's, uh, here's the sound. So, so what does the sound look like? Well, uh, it's going to be a sound pressure wave. Now, one of the things about these nuclei is that they have a map of frequency because different parts of the cochlea project to different parts of this nucleus. So um, we at first have to get the right frequency. So if we don't get the right frequency, the cell won't respond because that part of the basilar membrane won't wiggle. And so, so let's just, you know, put a, just a sine wave. That's only one frequency, but in a sense, that's kind of what it likes the best, or it likes a small range of frequencies. So if we look at the, the response to that, what, what we see is something called uh, a phase-locked response. And so what that means is it's locked, it's locked to, the, to the phase of the, uh, of the actual sound pressure wave. And what is the phase? Well, the phase is just, if you think of this like as a, as a cosine, like cosine is, is one at zero, and then the, uh, the cosine is zero when you get to 90 degrees, and then the cosine is minus one when you get to 180 degrees, and you get back 
it's, it's basically just the distance along this wave, also known as the, the phase angle. So, so you, can e you can either think of it as like you know, how far you are along this wave, or you can just think of it as an actual angle that goes around and around, because when you get back here, you're back to where you started. So that's why they call it phase, uh, a phase-locked response. So this guy is, this guy is phase-locked. And what does that look like? Uh, well, it looks like a response that happens uh, with a particular uh, offset from the peak. So there'll be, say, a spike here. So there's a spike. So say, and it doesn't have to spike on every every single, uh, you know, single uh, peak of the sound pressure. So say it, it didn't spike on this one, but if it spikes on this one, it's going to have that same, that, that same phase offset. So this, so this, this time right here is going to be always the same. So the same, same delta T. So so that's, that's what, the, what a phase-locked response is. So it always occurs at the same offset from the, the, the peak in the sound pressure. So it turns out this is very much like what we saw in the visual system, where this particular stream of information is paying attention to the exact time. That's why it's the time pathway. Uh, but it's kind of ignoring other things. And what are the other things? Well, one of the other things is the, is the amplitude of the signal. And so we can play another sound that has the same frequency, uh, but it's just a smaller amplitude. So what happens in that case is it won't necessarily respond to um, every every you know, individual uh, sound pressure peak, but if it does respond, it res will respond with the same, uh, the same phase offset, even though the sound is, is, is softer. And what does a softer sound look like? Well, it just looks like you know, something like this. So that's a, so that's a softer sound. This is, you know, smaller amplitude. Uh, softer. So, so that, so that, so, so it turns out it will give the same, so this will be the same here also. Same offset, even though the sound is softer. And so what this uh, pathway is doing is it's pretty much it's pretty much ignoring the amplitude. So even though the amplitude was, so you've got to do a little fiddling to do this because you know, the, the, the wave isn't coming up as quickly. And so the, the, the response, you know, in, in order to get the same offset in these two cases, a, a little, little work is required. And it turns out it's slightly sensitive to amplitude, but not that much. And so different, so you can play a really loud sound and you don't get that many more spikes than if you play a really soft sound. So, so, this, so this pathway is like the Y pathway in the visual system, because what does the Y pathway in the visual system do? It signals when there's a change, and it doesn't tell you much about the amplitude. It, it, so the, the response of a Y cell uh, is not that different as you make you know, objects uh, brighter and darker. Uh, but it responds really well to a change in brightness, but it, does, it kind of ignores the amplitude. So it's the same, same thing going on here. So this is the, this is the, the time pathway, nucleus magnocellularis. And so we have to remember you know, a couple of the features. So one of the features is this is a monaural, this one ear. So it's only getting input from one cochlea because we're going to be talking about if you're localizing things, you're going to have to compare left and left and right ears. So it's monaural, only only responds to one ear, and it's uh, it's frequency tuned. 
because it's getting input just from one part of the cochlea. So if you give it the wrong frequency, it doesn't care. And then, it's, and then last of all, it's phase locked. So those are the big uh, phase locked. So those are the big, uh, and the, the same thing will happen in a turtle. Uh, it won't phase lock to as high of a frequency, but same thing's going on. So it's a general, these are not just applying to owls. Okay, so that's the phase locked response. Everybody good on the phase locked? So it's just uh, kind of ignores amplitude, but pays exact attention to the to the time of the, the time of the uh, of occurrence of the peaks in the sound pressure wave. So, what's the other pathway? Well, the other pathway is the you know the amplitude pathway, and th in the auditory literature they call this you know the the amplitude pathway. And that's the X-like pathway, basically. And so what is the X-like pathway? So the X-like pathway is, I'm gonna make a drawing of where all these nuclei are uh, at, at the end so we can sort of tie them down to the anatomy. So that, that one's called the nucleus angularis because it's slightly bent looking. So that's nucleus angularis. Uh, and so that this is the, Amplitude pathway. This guy is also monaural. So it only responds to one ear. It's also frequency tuned. And, and this guy basically um, pays attention to amplitude and it kind of scrambles the phase. Amplitude. So it's paying attention. So it's so this guy is is basically, you know, paying attention to phase, but ignoring amplitude. Let's add one more, uh, one more down there. So ignore. Amplitude. So this guy pays attention to amplitude and it pretty much ignores phase. And so this is the X like X like pathway. It's uh, X like uh, it's it's smaller cells, um, and it's it's like the posterior ventral cochlear nucleus in mammals. So this is uh, mammals. So. So how does how does this one respond? Well, not surprisingly, this guy. Uh, if, you, if you play those same two, two sounds, you know, this one will, so here's, uh, you know, the sound and the response. So if you play a loud sound, oh, this guy, so here's a loud sound. Uh, this guy will respond, uh, but it won't respond in a particular, uh, particular phase. So what will, will happen is you'll get a spike. You might get a spike, you know, over here. And then you might get another spike over here. And another one, you know, over here, something like that. So it, it'll, it'll just scramble the phase. But if we play a softer sound, then we'll have a much, a much better representation of, of loudness. So let's... Here, let's put another spike in here so we have the same number of spikes. It won't be exactly the same, but it will be, it'll be close. It kind of, it will just basically ignore, ignore the amplitude and still give us a pretty good response to a, a soft sound. So if you look at the, the amplitude pathway, what's going to happen if we play a soft sound is we just get less spikes. So, so here, here we might just get one spike. So that's the, uh, this is the sound and the response. So what we've done here is we've, we've kind of scrambled the phase and paid attention to the amplitude. Here we've kind of ignored the amplitude as best we can and we're paying attention to the, uh, to the, to the phase. And it's like I said, it's just the it's just the same thing you see in the 
uh, in the visual system, where you take <coughs> one stream of information because there's only one set of inner hair cells that are that are driving this. And so, how on, you know, how on earth do you does the system do this? Because it's taking one stream of information, and it's kind of like the on and off, or the x and y in the in the visual system. It's actually it's actually sort of creating two streams of information out of one. And so in this case, uh, w we have a pretty good idea of how, how it, it does this. I mean, w one of the reasons to sort of talk about it this way is that you get a feeling for what the computational goal of the nervous system is. And all the different modalities do it in different ways. You know, like in the somatosensory system, you make something transient by building some little Patinian corpuscle around the end of a, of, a of a receptor. In the visual system, you've got the amacrine cells that are making the X and Y business. Here, what's doing the X and Y is, is, is the anatomy of the axons uh, that are coming off, uh, coming off of the cochlear ganglion cells. And so, so here's a single hair cell. So there's the little hairs on it. And here's the cochlear ganglion cell. So that's the, the cell, the spiral ganglion cell. Here's the little mini dendrite that the uh, that the uh, hair cell uh, synapse, there's the vesicles, uh, synapses on too. And so, so how do you make something like this, the time pathway? So if you go into the nucleus magnus cellularis or the anterior ventral cochlear nucleus in mammals, what do you find? Well, you find these little, you find, I, you find these little potato-like cells. They look like little, you know, that's, that's a neuron, a little, little potato-like neuron. And so why, is, you know, why did it get rid of all its dendrites? Uh, so it got rid of all its dendrites because there's capacitance in the dendrites. <laughs> so what's the way to minimize the capacitance of the cell is just turn it into a sphere. That's like the lowest possible uh, capacitance you could have. Uh, and what's bad about the capacitance? Well, it takes a little while to charge it up. And so if a signal comes in, a synaptic signal comes in, uh, if you've got a lot of capacitance, it's going to lollygag around and charge up the capacitors before it finally gets to spike. And so, so what happens is this axon comes off, and then it branches. And when it goes to the, so this is, uh, let's label this. This is um, cochlear, you know, spiral uh, ganglion cell. So, so that guy, when it, it synapses, it just synapses like on this little potato. And the synapses kind of like spread around, the, spread around the potato like that. And so when neurobiologists were looking at this, they could immediately just, went, you know, when they first, this is like 100 years ago, when they looked at these things, they could immediately see, yeah, something funny is going on there. <laughs> and so... And so they named it, and these, these are called um, the K, I don't know how you spell that, yeah. K, Calyx, K, let's see, there we go. Calyces of Held. So what is that? So who is Held? So Held was an auditory researcher. Um, Calyces is Latin plural for chalices. So it's the chalices of held, <laughs> because they look like a little, a little cup of synapses. And uh, so you can see why that's a good thing. You get rid of all the dendrites, you get a nice prompt response. Now, in order to be able to make the same response to different amplitudes, that's a little, yeah, that's a little more fiddly. How do we do that? That's, so there's some, there's some high-tech stuff going on, which we don't completely understand how we can give almost the same rate of response to a to a softer stimulus, but, but, that's how, but that's how it works. And then the exactly same spike train. So, you know, th if, if this guy spikes, it doesn't spike, sorry. If this guy releases this neurotransmitter because the, uh, you know, it got tweaked by the uh, tectorial membrane, a spike comes down. And so the exact same, so here's a spike coming down this way. So that exact same spike goes into another branch. It, it branches off because that's actually, 
remember when we, you know, the, the cochlear ganglion cell came in and it, it kind of branched over these nuclei. And it was, it was just the same, it was, this, it was the same axon. And so how does this, how does the same axon generate the amplitude signal? And so what the cells do, so this is, you know, nucleus magnocellularis here. What the cells in nucleus angularis look like is they're kind of, <coughs> they're smaller, but they have all these dendrites. And what's the result of that? Well, when the synapses come in, they sometimes synapse on the cell body, but sometimes they synapse out here, and maybe they synapse out here. And so the exact same signal comes in, but you synapse it out on different parts of the dendrite, and so what it does is it scrambles the phase because th these guys are going to be delayed relative to to the ones, that, uh, the ones here. And so if you really want to measure, accurately measure the amplitude of the signal, then you don't want to get sort of s screwed up by the, by, by the phase business and getting like locked to a particular, uh, a particular part, of the, part of the cycle. You just want to know, I just want to know on average, like what is the, you know, what is the loudness of the signal. And so these are, so, so these are the nucleus magnocellularis cells. These are nucleus angularis cells. And so, so here we can see it's a different way of doing it than in the somatosensory system or the, or the visual system, but we can see that the goal is the same. We're going to take this signal and emphasize different parts of the signal. So both of the things extracted here are present in the signal. So, you know, so these guys will be phase-locked because they're actually just you know, going up and down in the basilar membrane, and that's, they get the most tweak when they're at the highest point. And so, so that information... Both kinds of these information are, are in the spike stream coming down, uh, but now you can see how, how, the, the, uh, how the nervous system is, is basically anatomically generated these, these two streams. So now we have the, you know, from this, from this point on, you have the, you know, the time pathway, and this, this is kind of the origin, you know, the amplitude pathway. Time pathway. So yeah, and so just by a branch and a spike, a branch and an axon. I mean, again, like understand, like how the heck does this actually work in development? Like how does this axon know? You know, think how complicated this is. This axon, it's this, it's this one cell. It's got its DNA and its genes, and somehow it knows uh, when it's in the presence of the nucleus magnocellularis cells to like do a completely different synaptic structure than it does when it's in the presence of these these guys, it's the exact same, it's the exact same cell. It's getting signaled, it's getting signaled by kind of the environment of the nucleus magnocellularis versus the, the environment of the nucleus angularis. Okay, so any questions about uh, the, uh, the time pathway and the amplitude pathway? And so this is, this is kind of like, you know, the X and the Y pathway, the large cell, you know, large cell pathway that pays more attention to changes, and then this, the smaller cell pathway that pays more attention to, to amplitude difference and doesn't pay as much attention to, to changes. And like I said, we, we <coughs> you have the same kind of thing going, going on in mammals. You've got little stubby cells and the equivalent of the the nucleus magnocellularis. Octopus cells, that's what they call them there. Okay. No questions? All, all good. And so they're both frequency tuned. So both of these, both of these nuclei, they only get input from one ear and they're, and they're frequency, frequency tuned. So if you give it the wrong frequency, it just ignores it completely. So let's just say one last thing about, uh, so these, these cells, if you look in an owl, again, like, you know, you, uh, just like the absolute highest tech auditory system, uh, in an owl, these guys can, 
uh, phase lock up to 8 kilohertz. So I'll, uh, you know, phase locking. to 8 kilohertz. Now think about what that means. 8 kilohertz is 8,000 cycles per second. Now let's consider like a cell. What is the absolute fastest a cell can fire? It might be able to fire like, you know, 500 hertz or something like that, like 500 spikes per second. That's as, because a spike has a minimal, a minimal width to it. And so in an owl, these neurons can actually hit the right phase in an 8 kilohertz signal. Uh, which is, you know, it's probably like, it's probably like one, one eighth of the width of a spike. So it's, it's like incredibly accurately timing the spike. Now, it, it obviously can't hit 8,000 spikes per second, so it's only hitting every 12th or, or 15th uh, peak in the sound pressure wave. But when it does, it just nails it right on. And one of the one of the ways that you can sort of see this, uh, there's something you know called uh, cochlear, coch it's like a strange name, cochlear microphonics. So microphonics is something from you know an earlier day, like when the microphone starts vibrating. And but if you go into the, if you go into one of these nuclei, and just you know, you've got a bunch of cells in there. Don't try to record from the cells. Just, just put the electrode in and just kind of listen to the roar of the crowd. What you see is, if you play in a, a sound, is you see like almost a pure sine wave uh, come out of the nucleus. And uh, the reason is because all those cells are all responding at the same, the same time. They're only hitting like every 10th spike or every 15th, uh, not spike, every 15th, uh, peak in the sound pressure signal, but there's, there's some friends that are hitting the 12th peak and the 17th peak, and so when they add them all up, you get this like, you know, pure sine wave coming out of the, out of the nucleus. And so, uh, and so, you can, so you can see that, you know, up to... What, so when people first did this, they said, what, what's going on? How could that possibly work? You know, because you put an electrode in, you play in an 8 kilohertz signal, and you get like an 8 kilohertz signal out of the out of the neurons, you say, how could they possibly give us an 8 kilohertz signal? Because at best, they can spike like 500 times a second. That would be like, you know, 0.5 kilohertz. So, yeah, so it's, a, it's an amazing system. But you can, you can record that in mammals, too. That's kind of a quick and dirty way of sort of seeing, you know, seeing what's going on in one of these nuclei. So, okay, so let's, <coughs> let's draw an anatomical diagram of some of the connections in, in a little more detail than we did last time. So last time, last time I gave an anatomical drawing of the connections in mammals, and unfortunately, some of the nuclei have different names. They've, the, some of the anatomists that work on birds finally bit the bullet and renamed their nuclei after the after the mammalian ones. They didn't do that with the nucleus magnocellularis and nucleus angularis, but uh, some, of, some of them were renamed up in the midbrain. So, but some of the names are still, still different. And there's, there's only like five or six of them that you have to remember. So, but the goal of the next couple lectures is to see how we construct this map of space in the owl because the owl actually the owl has a map of auditory space so it has a two-dimensional it's, it's constructed a two-dimensional map of you know where a sound is coming from independent of its frequency and so that's what we're trying to trying to figure out and there's about four stages uh, along the way so Let's draw a big, a big fat brainstem here. It's got plenty of, plenty of room for the nuclei. Okay, so, and then uh, 
We'll put the pons midbrain junction here. <laughs> so everything mostly respects the pons midbrain junction. So this is, you know, midbrain and pons. And, you know, what's the reason for, you know, spending so much time in the brainstem? Well, it's more, like I said last time, more stuff happens in the brainstem uh, in the auditory system. So, because, partly just because you've, you've got to deal with all these rapid changes in time. So here's the, here's the midline here. And here's the, here's the fourth ventricle. I'll just dot that in so it doesn't confuse us too much. Okay, so where are the, where are the nuclei here? So the first nucleus is that more uh, anterior one here, which is the uh, nucleus magnocellularis, and here's the nucleus angularis. This guy. So you should remember those, nucle NM for nucleus magnocellularis and nucleus angularis. So the magnocellularis was the, that's easy to remember because the Y cells are the big cells, the transient ones, the time ones. So, so if we look out, if we look out here, we've got, we've got the cochlea. So here's the cochlea and there's a hair cell in the cochlea. And here's that ganglion cell that's in right next to the cochlea. And so that just comes in and it branches. And the exact same spike stream goes into these two guys, but funny, funny different synapses in those two. And so now let's go to the, we're going to go to like another stage here another stage here and another stage here. So like four, four levels of processing here. So now there's another nucleus. And I'll talk about next time about how this one works. Uh, so I'll make it nice and big. It actually is almost this big relative to the, it's so, it's a, if you've looked at different animals through the microscope, you look at a, at uh, even something like a songbird, you, you know, it has a pretty big one of these guys, but you look at an owl, and it's just like, whoa, it's like five times bigger, eight times bigger. <laughs> so, so this guy is called uh, Nucleus laminaris. So, and this one's more or less equivalent in the mammal to the medial superior olive. So this guy is uh, uh, Nucleus laminaris, because it, it was kind of laminar. Laminaris. So it looks like the medial superior olive. And that gets input from, so let's uh, draw these cells. So they come through the nucleus like that, and they make a bunch of synapses as they're going through the nucleus. There's a bunch of synapses going through the nucleus. And so here's the cells, cells in the nuclei, in, in the nucleus laminaris. So, so what happens is this is a binaural nucleus. So this guy is, is binaural. And how does it get binaural? It, it gets binaural by breaking the rule of Sereno so the rule of Serena was not absolute. It's like maybe 90% of the connections in the brain. Um, but because the corpus callosum breaks the rule of Sereno, but uh, the other 90% or 95% of the connections are within a hemisphere. So almost all the connections are within a hemisphere. And then there's a, a few stray ones that go across, but almost everything is in the same hemisphere. And so that's the same in the auditory system. Almost everything follows the rule of Sereno. But this breaks it, and so how does it break it? Well, the nucleus magnocellularis from the other side uh, projects over there. So a cell over here um, basically comes over, and it just 
breaks the rule of Serino and synapses on these guys going in the opposite direction. So it synapses on, on these guys here. Those are the synapses onto the nucleus laminaris cells. So, so this guy is N and M on this side. So, so I've only drawn kind of just the left half of the pathway. So if we look, you know, there's another, I if I draw everything in, it, it sort of creds it up. So there's another nucleus laminaris on this side, and there's another nucleus angularis on this side. Uh, and if we look at those, if we look at this guy, the nucleus laminaris on the other side, it's going to be getting input from both ears too. So, so you could, so after I finish this diagram, what you need to do is take a mirror image of it and flip it around, and, and then you'd see all the connections. So I'm just drawing the, I'm just drawing the pathway coming from the, from the left cochlea. But there's there's exactly the same thing going on, on the other side. So there's binaural neurons on the other side too. And you know they they basically, it's kind of like the visual system. This left nucleus laminaris deals with left space, and the right nucleus laminaris deals with right space. And so it sort of, it sort of divides space up into. And why is it left to left? Because it's behind the pons membrane junction. OK, so that's the, that's the, the start. So now let's draw some of the, the midbrain nuclei. And so how many we have up there? So one. One, two, three, four, five, six, like six things up there, but we'll have to remember a couple of them. So there's some, some nuclei that are, are sitting right here, and those are like the, the nuclei of the lateral lemniscus. So, so these guys uh, sort of like mammalian nuclei of the lateral lemnus, lemniscus. So that's just a big bundle of fibers that you can see. And so why are they nuclei of the lateral lemniscus? Well, first they looked at the lateral lemniscus, this big bundle of fibers, and then they realized, oh, there's some cells in there. <laughs> and then they realized, oh, they've, there's actually multiple groups of cells in there. They have maps within them. And so that's... Uh, that's how they became the nuclei, nuclei of the lateral lemniscus. And they have some ridiculous names. So this one's called VLVA, and this is VLVP. I don't have to remember these guys. Uh, and then when we go up further into the, so these are in the midbrain, but there's more in the, there's more nuclei in the midbrain. There's, there's a, a, a big nucleus called the, central nucleus of the inferior colliculus, and then it's got a little chunk off to the side. And then up here, uh, we have the superior colliculus. So, so this guy is the superior, we haven't talked about that yet. So that's the, that's the one that's involved in eye movements. And we'll, we'll talk a whole bunch about you know, how, how the superior colliculus registers different modalities and deals with things that are disappearing and a lot of, and how it inf strongly influences the cortex and is involved in attention and up updating as you move your eyes around. So that, but that's for later. But this guy is the inferior colliculus. Uh, so colliculus means little hill. And so there was sort of the, the more superior little hill and the, and the more inferior little hill. And so this one is divided up into uh, uh, two chunks. So, so this guy is the inferior colliculus, central nucleus, lateral part. Uh, so unfortunately, there's two, two subdivisions. So you know wh what is this? So this is you know inferior. We start off with the inferior colliculus. That's IC, uh, and then there's several different parts of it. So there's the so that's small c for the central part. And then the central part, unfortunately, has uh, uh, two parts to it, lateral subpart. 
And so you might wonder, like, couldn't they have named it like a little bit better? And so the, the, the problem was they didn't realize if you just look at the, before you did some physiology, when you just looked at this, the lateral part and the medial part looked very, di very similar to each other. You couldn't really tell the difference. And so this is the, sorry, that's not the lateral part. It's the medial part. Okay, so then uh, ICC lateral. Sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, so the medial, this is, <coughs> this is medial, <laughs> uh, meaning mid midline. Okay, and then it's lateral, lateral going out that way. So there's that one. And then this guy is called the inferior colliculus external part. So that's, that's inferior, so inferior collic external. That's where the space, that's where the space map is. So, so what are the connections of, of this guy? Well, if we look at the, at the, the lateral part, what happens is axons come out of the, come out of the nucleus laminaris and they cross over following the rule of Sereno and synapse up there. And the, the same thing happens for the other nucleus laminaris. Its axons will mainly go, the right nucleus laminaris will mainly go to the left inferior colliculus central lateral subpart. Okay, so that's, um, um, now we should put, I'll put a, I'll put a star on the ones that break the rule of Sereno. So this guy, this guy is, uh, this guy breaks the rule of Sereno. That nucleus magnus cellularis that's, that's going to the other, that's going to the other nucleus magnus cellularis, nu nucleus laminaris on the opposite side, even though it's not crossing the pons membrane junction. And then these guys in here project to the inferior colliculus external, and then that space map then goes up to the superior colliculus because the superior colliculus needs to know uh, know what um, you know where things are, where auditory things are, because it wants to look at au or, in the case of the owl, it wants to sort of like uh, grab onto uh, auditory things. Okay, so we have a few uh, extra projections to get to the inferior colliculus medial part, and so. What happens is there's a projection that comes out of nucleus angularis, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop in the midbrain. It actually just sort of goes up to the inferior colliculus medial part from the amplitude pathway. Um, but it also needs to do a comparison. Uh, between the left and the right ear uh, in amplitude in addition to this comparison that it's going to do in in time. And so uh, so how does that information gets, get in there? Well, that information gets in there because there's also a stop off here. And uh, this guy goes up here. That's still all monaural information. So how does the binaural information get in there? Well, you've got to have a, a projection from this guy that goes up to here. And so that one is another one. This one right here is another one that breaks the rule of Sereno because it has to. So this is nucleus angularis on the right side, crossing the pons membrane junction, but staying on the same side. And so that's how the that's how the comparison of amplitude between the left and the right ears is done. Um, and um, there's left uh, one more. We have that nucleus there, but it's got no input. So so it turns out if we take this guy that's coming from our nucleus laminaris cell. Um, 
that guy also branches off here. And so this, this VLVA one is, you know, a time pathway. So that guy's a time and this guy's an amplitude. And this, this one, uh, you know, this, this one is like the nucleus of the lateral and this gives dorsal. And this guy is like the uh, nucleus of the lateral and this gives intermediate in, in a mammal. So that's, if you want to sort of look, so the same nucleus is there. Okay, and then <coughs> last but not least, we have uh, this guy is also going up into our our time pathway. So this is, so basically this is, you know, this is the time one and this is the amplitude one. And so it, it turned out that was something that was discovered to be just right in the inferior colliculus, two different parts of the inferior colliculus. Okay, so I think I got I got all the wires. That's only half of the wires. Now we just do make a copy of that, flip it around, and then uh, do it for the other side, and you see the the whole picture. But you can see, like, the great majority of these connections do follow the rule of Sereno. So, like, the cochlear come in, they stay on the same side, they project to the nucleus laminaris, and the nucleus laminaris mainly projects to the opposite side. But then you've got, you know, the other nucleus laminaris projecting to the opposite side in order to fill in fill in space. So you have like the left and the right half of space. Okay. So, is there any question about the um, overall anatomy? So what, which one should you, re you remember? So remember the nucleus magnocellularis and nucleus angularis and the nucleus laminaris. Definitely remember all these three because they're sort of big, big pathways. And then remember Remember these three up here. So the inferior colliculus central medial, inferior, that's the amplitude, inferior colliculus central lateral, and the inferior colliculus external that has the space. That, this is our goal. We have to get to the space map. <laughs> so, re so remember, remember those, because I'll talk about, so next time I'll talk about like how does the, how does this nucleus work? So how does, uh, how, do, how does this one start to figure out things about uh, time delays? And then, and then we'll talk about how do these nuclei are pretty similar to, uh, or the lateral one is pretty similar to this, but then, then we'll go and figure out how once we've done whatever calculation we do here, which is only sort of a partial calculation, how do we actually get a space map, a real space map out of it? Okay, I almost finished on time that time. So, any question about the um, about the uh, connections of the auditory system? Then there's equivalent connections in mammals, but the, these are all the owl. Yeah, let's put here so owl auditory brainstem. So it's owl auditory brainstem. Okay, so any any final questions about, uh, I think I drew everything even bigger than last year, so you can actually see see some of the different wires. You can clearly see what the problem is in neuroanatomy. This is like a tiny fraction of what's there. This is like, you know, this is like, you know, 5% of the connections. Uh, if you put them all in, it's just like a hopeless, hopeless rat's nest of, of different connections. But... Uh, uh, it does a lot of processing down in the brainstem, and so it can sort of like uh, not lose some of this high temporal resolution data. Uh, and one one last last thing about you know sort of how the nervous system in general works. It it does like a really good job at the, at the input of doing these complicated comparisons, like high performance hardware on the input. And then once it's actually done that, sort of digitized it basically, it doesn't have to do as much high performance work later. So all the high performance work is, is done down here in order to sort of essentially 
spatialize the signal, make different small teeny time delays appear at different places. And then once you've made them appear at different places, now they're just at different places and you can just send those different places to a map somewhere else. And so you won't have to do, you won't have to do the high performance measuring tiny time differences up here anymore. So you can have lazy big cells, big dendrites, you know, no problem because you already sort of separated things out by the high performance circuitry here. And so, so that's one of the things to think about. So later on, the cells don't have to be so fussy and get rid of their dendrites because they've already done the, this initial high performance calculation and spread it out across space and now you've got a map and then you, you no longer need that super high performance uh, uh, processing. Okay. Yeah. This one? Yes, this is the time pathway. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so nucleus magnocellularis coming down to laminaris. This is the time pathway, and, and it mostly, it mostly goes to, um, it mostly goes to the time nucleus of the lateral lumniscus and the time inferior colliculus, central nucleus, lateral part. <laughs> yeah, so this is, the, this is time here, mostly getting from, from this guy. And this is amplitude, mostly getting from, uh, from, from this guy, getting from the angularis. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> there were several version differences, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Okay, I think we can end the recording there, David. <laughs>